Good evening and welcome to all. Tonight's class is dedicated by David and Ida Schattenstein. In the merit of our dear friend Levi Yitzchak ben Cyril, may he enjoy a complete and speedy recovery. Bechol Ramach Evorov Vishasagidov and enjoy many long, healthy, happy, and prosperous years together with his wife, his children, and his entire family. La Arichus Yomim Vishonim Toivos. Tonight's learning is dedicated in his merit and in his honor. The Schattensteins also dedicate tonight's class, Lahavdil ben Chaim Lechaye Hachaim, in the loving memory of Rabbi Gavriel Noyach and Rifki Holtzberg, whose second yardsite was today Rosh Chodesh Kislev, the first day of the month of Kislev, two years since the horrific massacre in the Chabad house of Mumbai, together with the other Kedoshim who were murdered in the Chabad center of Mumbai, India. Also dedicated in the loving memory of Alter Shula, Swerdlov, whose first yard site was commemorated recently, a young soul killed in Jerusalem, the daughter of Rabbi Yossi and Hindel Swerdlov. Dedicated as well in the loving memory of Esther Adel, Bas Rabbi Stroll, Eliezer Cohen, in honor of her Shloishim a few days ago. As well as in the loving memory of Rabbi Menachem Mendel, Rabbi Yisrael HaKoyen Deren, who passed away last Friday, Tehei Nishmasam Tzrura B'Tzroir HaChayim. May their families be comforted among the mourners of Zion and Jerusalem. And may we all glean inspiration and strength and courage from their memories. They tell the story about a Jewish couple. (laughs) There are a lot of stories about Jewish couples, but this is one of them who arrived to the rabbi's house at 2 a.m. in the morning. The next morning is the bris, the circumcision of their newborn son, and they have a crisis at 2 a.m. The rabbi says, what's going on, my dear friends? And they say, we got into a major dispute. What should be the name of the child? How do we call this newborn child at the bris? So the rabbi turns to the mother, what would you like to be the the name of the new child? I want his name to be Moshe. How about you, father? What would you like to call your newborn child? He says, I would like his name to be Moshe. So what's the argument if you both want Moshe? The mother explains, you have to understand, rabbi. My father's name was Moshe. My husband's father's name was Moshe. But they were two very different Moshe's. My husband's father, with all due respect, everybody knows that he was a Veltzganev. He was a thief. He was a Schwindler. In Yiddish, that is a, a schemer, a deceptive person. He was a gambler. He was an alcoholic. He was a narcissist. He was an addict. And he was a self-centered human being. My father, she says, My father was a noble spirit, a gentle soul, a true friend, a lover of people, a real man of honesty and integrity. I want my child should not be named after my father-in-law. I want my child to be named after my father, Moshe. My husband insists that Moshe is his father. He agrees with the reputation his father came to be known to have, but he says after everything said and done, it's my father, and I want my son to carry my father's name. So we are here by the rabbi to ask for his advice. 
And so the argument goes back. She's screaming one way and he's screaming the other way. She says, I don't want my son to have the, the genes of your father. And he says, but it's my father. I want him to have his name. And so the rabbi calms them down and he says he needs a few moments to contemplate this question. And after meditation for a few moments, he comes back to them and he says, the verdict is that your son's name will be Moshe. Brilliant. After whom they both shout? After his father or after her father? And the rabbi says, the answer to that will be determined only when the child grows up. To find out who he was named after, we'll have to wait till this young boy becomes an adult. If he lives as a selfish, narcissistic, self-centered beastly human being then we will know that he carries the name of his paternal grandfather if he turns out to be a noble mensch we will know that he has indeed been named after his maternal grandfather the opening of the portion of ayatsi in genesis articulates one of the great biblical visions jacob alone at night, fleeting from the wrath of his brother Esau. Esau lies down to rest. And there he experiences not a nightmare, but an epiphany. He has a dream. The dream of the famous ladder of Jacob, it's etched on the earth, but its top, its head, reaches heaven. Now let us open up right below the video there is a PDF document with a curriculum. Please open up your PDF. Let's read inside. Vayachalom, Jacob dreams. Vihine sula There is a ladder which is resting on the earth, but its top is reaching heaven. Vihine malache elikim oilim v'yordim boy. And behold, there were angels of God going up and down the ladder. V'hinei Hashem Nitzavalav, and above it stood God. And the dream continues as the Torah continues to tell the narrative of the dream of Jacob has that night. But what exactly were the angels doing? Why were they going up and down on a ladder? Were they going up? Were they going down? It sounds like they were doing both, right? Oilim, they went up and they went down. But why? For what purpose? Do angels exercise? Are there treadmills in heaven? Why were they running back and forth? Where were they coming from? Where were they going to? You may say, it's just a dream. It's a dream. And there's a story about, to support that answer, one of the great Hasidic masters was the holy Rabbi Yisrael Ruzhener, the holy master Rabbi Yisrael of the city of Rizhen. And he was known yet as a child to be a prodigy, so that when he was sitting in yeshiva in Cheder in the classroom as a young child, he knew to ask every question that Rashi, the great biblical French commentator Rabbi Shlomo Yitzchaki, asks on the verses, even before the teacher would present the question and the answer, the, the young Yisrael Ruzhener was a young orphan, a brilliant, brilliant mind became one of the great spiritual masters of the Jewish people during the 18th and early 19th century. He came to be known as the Heleke Ruzhener. He would anticipate every question of Rashi and ask it first. And the teacher was used to the fact that soon, if there's a question that Rashi raises, Yisraelik will raise it before even Rashi is discussed. And so they were learning the portion of Ayetze, and the teacher came to this verse just quoted, that the angels of God were going up, they were ascending the ladder, and they were descending the ladder. Rashi asks his famous question. What's his question? Angels are in heaven. So they were first descending the ladder and then ascending the ladder. They're not on earth to first ascend and then descend. Why does the Torah first say, Oilim v'yordin? The teacher remained silent, anticipating the question of the young Yisraelik. But he wasn't asking. The, the teacher turns to him finally and says, No. So he says, Vasnu, what are you knowing me? 
He says, no, why don't you ask the question? He says, there's no question. What do you mean there's no question? Why don't you ask the obvious question in this verse? The young Yisrael says, there's no question. What's the question? For me, it's all clear. He says, the question is, it says, the angels of God were going up and they were going down. But that's senseless. First they came down and then they go up. They're coming down from heaven. And the young Yisrael says, it's not a question. The teacher says, why not? He says, you're forgetting. This was a dream. <laughs> go ask questions on a dream. You're going to start dissecting and analyzing and scrutinizing the logic behind your dreams. The whole idea of dreams is that there's no logic to dreams. As we know of our own dreams. Angels are going up and down. But we all understand it's an anecdotal story, but Rashi asks the question. Because dreams are significant. Even our dreams are significant, at least sometimes. Maybe not always, but sometimes. And details in dreams can sometimes be very revealing and extremely revealing. Especially this dream, a dream recorded in the Torah, a dream experienced by our patriarch Jacob on his way to go build a house and a family and give birth ultimately to the 12 tribes of Israel. It's a dream as we will see, as we know, the Torah says captures Jacob's destiny and future. Every detail of it is significant. What were the angels doing? Many diverse insights have been presented to this phenomenal dream from the simple interpretation to the homiletical to the esoteric. This evening we are going to discuss one insight on the purpose of the angels going up and down the ladder and it's presented in the Talmud. In Shraktet Chulin, please open up source number two, in your curriculum below the video, Zagda Gemara Chulin Dav Tzadik Aleph Amid Beis, Tractate Chulin 91b. Tana, we have learned. We have learned in a Braisa. We have learned in a Talmudic, a Braisa Talmudic text. Oilin umestaklin bidiyuknoi shalmaila, viyodin umestaklin bidiyuknoi shalyakov lamata. The angels went up the ladder and were gazing at the visage of Jacob above. They came down to gaze at the image of Jacob below. There's a ladder. They go up and look at what Jacob looks like above. They come down and look at Jacob's visage, the Yukne Shal Yaakov below. And the Talmud continues. Boy Lisekunah. They wanted to endanger his life. As Rashi says, Mach maskina, because they were envious of him. Miyad immediately, v'inei Hashem nitzavalav, immediately the dream continues that God was standing above the ladder to protect Jacob from the envy of the angels. Omar Reb Shimon ben Lakish, Rabbi Shimon, the son of Lakish said, Il male mikra kasuv if If the Torah would not explicitly state it, we humans would not be able to say it. At that moment, God was like the human being who was waving over his son. As Rashi says, A child who's fanning his son to save him from the scorching heat that can burn him up. The father is standing above him and fanning and cooling the body temperature of his child. The same the Torah says here. Jacob is endangered by the envy of the angels and his father God is standing above and fanning, fanning the flames of envy. That's the story, that's the interpretation of the Talmud. What is the meaning of this cryptic Talmudic interpretation? What are these two images of Jacob? Why were the angels scrutinizing them? What does it mean they went up the ladder and they looked at his image above, they came down, they looked at his image below? Why did he have two different images? What was the significance of it? Why were the angels involved? And what is the meaning of the continuation of the Talmud? They got jealous. Why did they get jealous? They looked at his image above, they looked at his image below. Why is this a reason for envy? 
And what is the significance of comparing God to a father who's fanning his child not to be burnt by scorching heat? What is the meaning of this? The image of Jacob, the Yoiknoi Shal Yaakov, as the Torah, the Talmud puts it, Yoiknoi, his image, his visage, this Yoiknoi Shal Maila, his visage below, above, the Yoiknoi Shal Mata, his visage below. The visage of Jacob will be discussed yet once again in another context, in another generation. And let us recall that instant. It's in two portions from Vayetze, Vayeshev. Jacob already gave birth to his children with his wives. One of the children was Joseph, Yosef, who attracted the tremendous envy of his siblings. They throw him into a pit. They ultimately sell him into slavery, into Egyptian bondage, where he becomes a servant in the house of Potiphar. Potiphar's wife, as we know, takes a liking to him. And she nudges him again and again to have relations with her. Joseph refuses. And yet there is one day, and you can look it up at source number three in your curriculum below the video. It was a day when nobody was home and she remained alone at home and Joseph came home to do his work. And this was the moment she finally felt she can get him. And she approaches him and she demands from him, Sheikh Vaimi, lie with me. Joseph ultimately refuses. She's holding on to his cloak, and if Ayonos Vaitsi runs outside, she his cloak tears and she still has a part of it through which, which she uses as evidence that he tried to violate her and ultimately has him incarcerated in prison. The Talmud and the rabbis in the Midrash deduce from a nuanced reading of the verses that Joseph actually almost succumbed to Potiphar's non-stop requests for him to be with her physically. Look in source number three, he comes home to do his work. One of the interpretations in the Talmud is that Joseph, after all of her requests and demands, ultimately could not withstand the pressure. Now we have to understand, Potiphar's wife was not nice about it. She threatened him with torture. She threatened him with incarceration, which she followed through on. She threatened him with death. She utilized every trick and scheme in the book the Talmud describes, how she dressed, how she presented herself, in order to lure Joseph into her promiscuous trap. Joseph was a 17-year-old young boy, no future. He was destined to be a slave for life. In this home, he has risen to success. And this was the only ability for him to live a half-normal life. No one would find out. It would not blemish his family, nor the reputation of his family, his parents, his siblings. According to the Talmud, Joseph almost succumbed to Potiphar's wife. And what stopped him? Says the Midrash, in Vayeshev, the Tanchuma, the Zoyar in portion of Vayechi, the Talmud puts it a little differently, it's all in source number three, that the moment Joseph succumbed to Potiphar's wife and was about to engage in the promiscuous relationship with her, Rod Muzdi Yoiknoi Shal Bachaloin. In the window, Joseph suddenly saw the image of Jacob, his father, and when he saw the image of Jacob, his father, he abstained. And not only did he abstain, he rose up and he ran away outside, leaving his rented cloak in her hand, in her arms. Here again we ask the question, what was it about Jacob's image that had such a powerful influence over Joseph's conscience? Joseph knew what his father looked like. Joseph was the closest of the sons to his father. He studied with him. He spent time with him. Jacob loved him more than other children. He made for him a special ksoinus basm, a beautiful, colorful tunic. It's not like Joseph never saw the image of his father. What was it about the image of his father that the rabbis felt had this power? 
to liberate him from the trenches of immorality that he was about to succumb to at that fateful moment in this young teenager's life in Egypt. Every person has two images. Every person has diuknoi lamaila and diuknoi lamata. Diukin is an image. There is your image above and there is your image below. There is not a single human being, not you nor I nor any other person who does not profess two images, two faces, two personalities, two identities. One is Lamaila, one is a heavenly image, and one is Lamata, one is an earthly image. What are these two images? There is who you are, that's one image of you. But there's another image, you have another image, and that is the person you can be, the person you were meant to be, the person you were called to be, the person you're capable of being. There is the you experienced in your own mind and in your own reality. But then there is the you, the way it was envisioned by God. When God created you, God had a vision of who you are, what He wants from you. Why is He interested in you? What is your ultimate purpose and mission? What do you represent with your life, with your being, with your daily existence? There is how the you is experienced by yourself in your own vision. But then there is your image above, the way God experienced you in His mind. The moment you were brought into existence. This is also an image. It's your image above. How does God see you? When He breathed your soul into your body, how did He perceive you? So we have two faces. We have two personalities. I have my face down here below, but I also have my face up there above. And this is true about every human being. And your face above is the way your image is in your full potential. What is your true calling, your true potential? You're being in your full majesty and splendor, in your full glory. Who is the ultimate you if you were to suck the marrow out of your resources and out of your life? They say, what's the definition of chutzpah? Chutzpah is somebody who comes to a psychiatrist because he has a split personality and then he wants a group discount. They say that uh, Richard Nixon, before he resigned after the Watergate scandal, reportedly leaving the White House, he gazed at the portrait of his old rival, JFK, President John Kennedy. And he started to speak to the portrait. And he wanted to know why is it that America is infatuated with Camelot, with the Kennedys. Why do they love Kennedy and why are they filled with such scorn towards him, towards Nixon? So Nixon steers up at Kennedy's portrait and he says, you know the difference between you and me? When they look at you, when the American people look at you, they see what they want to be, what they would like to be. When they look at me, they see what they are. And most people don't like what they are. They love you. They hate me because I'm a reflection of what they are. You're a reflection of what they want to be. In a more broad sense, in a more grand sense, in a spiritual sense, each of us 
has two personas. There's the heavenly persona, there's the earthly counterpart. The heavenly persona represents what you truly want to be, what you're capable of being, what you're called to be. How does God picture you? How do you picture yourself at your most elevated, inspired moments? But then there's the image below. There's actually what you look like. What you make of yourself in your daily life. How often do these two images match up in your life? Your image above and your image below. Usually... We want a group discount because there is a split. Rarely do the two images come together. Often what I am is a pale copy of what I ought to be. What I am is often an impoverished reflection of the full power and potential that lay embedded in the subcellars of my soul and my mind. There is an expression by Rabbi Schneir Zalman of Liadi, the founder of the Chabad school, the Alter Rebbe, he once said, Afayid daf men kukin, in machshove hakdume da adam kadman. He used a very profound Kabbalistic term, let me try to translate and elucidate. Upon a Jew you must gaze the way he stands, the way he is situated, in the primordial thought of the primordial man. There is a state in Kabbalah known as Adam Kadmon. This is the primordial man. It's the source of all of existence. It's the persona which encompasses every single human being that would ultimately live in our world. So the Rabbi the Alter Rebbe, Rabbi Shnei Zaman was saying, you look at a person, you must look at him or her in their most pristine state. Look at them the way they're situated, the way they stand in God's initial thought and plan that they exist. Who they represent in God's original mind, that's what you have to see in them. Not just their image below, their image above. Ah! Now you understand why the angels were going up and down. This is what the Talmud is saying. They went up and they see Jacob's image above. They come down and they see his image below. And they're astonished because never have they encountered a person in whose the two images were integrated into a seamless whole. They were overwhelmed. They go up and they look at his image above, his potential his calling what he ought to be. And then they came down and they looked at his image below what he was. And the two were identical. They were a spitting image of each other. This was novel. This was unique. This was extraordinary. They never saw such a thing in their life. Because Jacob lived his life to his fullest. He actualized himself completely and absolutely. He brought to fruition every one of his faculties and powers and potentials. He did not allow fear or guilt or shame or self-depreciation or any other factor undermine his image above to be fully realized in his image below. And that's why the angels were going up and down. Now let's go to the Joseph story. You see why the image of Jacob caused Joseph to abstain. Years and years pass after this dream. Jacob is already an older man. He already has children. There's a fight in the family. Joseph is sold into slavery. And he's facing enormous temptation. And he's about to succumb. But suddenly he sees the image of who? Of his father. And we remember what the Talmud tells us about the image of his father, that it was unique, that the angels going up and down at the ladder saw the image above and the image below. 
and they realize that it's the same image. And this is the image that suddenly Joseph imagines. He sees an earthly visage fully reflective of its celestial counterpart. This is what gave Joseph the fortitude to smack his impulse in the face and to dismiss emphatically the noble woman's destructive lure. Because Joseph became cognizant that there is so much more to him than a tempted youngster craving to satisfy the cravings of a married woman. When he saw the image of his father in the window, he remembered one thing about himself. I am not only a physical, beastly animal. I am a knot in which heaven and earth are interlaced. I am a candle of God lit in the cosmic way. And thus Joseph says, no. Another image might have not helped him. But when he saw the Muzdi Yoikno Yaakov Aviv, when he saw the image of Jacob his father, and what does the image of Jacob his father represent? It represents the human being who here below carries the full majesty and the full moral grandeur and purity and holiness and kindness of what a human being is truly in his or her most pristine self. A human being who is truly a messenger of God, an ambassador of God, to introduce purity into the world, to introduce transcendence into the world. That's the image of his father. And when he saw that image, he was capable of seeing himself in a new light. He was capable of viewing himself not only from the image below, I am simply a physical bodily creature who right now needs to satisfy or wants to satisfy the craving of Potiphar's wife. He saw himself in a deeper way. And when he saw himself in a deeper way and he understood what he truly is meant to be, what he's truly capable of, he said, no, he ran away. This is probably one of the great calamities of a generation that stopped teaching its children about the image above, about the Muzdi Yoikne Shalmail. When we ingrain in our youth the exclusive doctrine of evolution, who are we? We are creatures who evolved from apes, from monkeys, from other primates, and essentially there's no difference between the animal and the human being. We give people only an understanding of their image here below, and we deprive them from their image below. We deprive them not only from an understanding of who they are, but also an understanding of who they can be who they truly are in their source and therefore what they're capable of striving for and achieving. What deprives so, what deprives so many of us from the addictions or habits or temptations to live decadent lives, to live unproductive lives, to live meaningful lives, and sometimes to live filthy and immoral lives is a certain entrenched low self-esteem, not just in the therapeutic sense that my ego is not fully developed, but when I think poorly of who I am, what I represent, what my destiny is. The most severe blow to self-esteem comes from the idea that you're merely a two-legged beast who evolved from apes and bacteria. Your great-great-grandfather was an ape, So what do you really expect of yourself? Is there anything really deeper? It's a celestial illusion. We have lost it. That every youngster needs to understand about themselves. You know they tell the story about this camel. The baby camel 
turns to its mother and says, Mommy, I have a few questions to ask. Mommy says, Sure, my dear, ask. The baby camel says, Why do we have these flat feet and these three large flat toes? And the mommy says, My dear Babala, my dear baby, because we are destined to walk long distances through the desert. And when we're walking on the sand, in order we should be able to walk and remain intact and strong, we have to have these types of feet and toes. Mommy, tell me, why do we have these long eyelashes? And the mother says, we have these long eyelashes because when the wind comes and starts blowing the sand in the desert, we don't want it to come into our eyes and damage them, so we have these long eyelashes to protect us. Mommy, you have a third question. Sure, the mother camel says, ask my son, ask why do we have this huge hump? And the mother says, Ah, we sometimes have to traverse long miles in the desert. So the hump allows us to store water on our backs so that we would not die from dehydration and we can always quench our thirsts with the water that we carry on our humps through the long distances in awesome deserts. Mommy, I have one more question. If this is the case, and this is the reason we have flat feet and three flat toes and long eyelashes and a unique camel-like hump, so why are we here stuck in a cage in the zoo? If this is really who we are. This is a question that man must ask but only if he or she knows about the two images. It's a question we ask because we're made up of two images. But sometimes we ask the question consciously and sometimes we ask it unconsciously because we have often been deprived of this deep awareness. But the question is there burning in the essence of the human soul. Why am I locked up in a cage in captivity when I am empowered to be able to transform a desert? Why do I see myself in such bleak and dark terms? Why do I undermine myself? Why do I feel undeserving and able? Why can't I be closer to my Diyokner Shalmaila, to my image above? And when Joseph saw that, he knew he was capable of more. It's below your dignity. It's below your calling. It's not who you are. This is not what you need for self-respect. It's not what you need for happiness. It's not what you need for self-assurance. It's not what you need for wholesomeness. Don't deprive yourself of what you're capable of. It will anyway not satisfy you because it's not who you are. You don't belong in a cage. <laughs> you belong somewhere else. They say in the name of the Baal Shem Tev, a beautiful insight. The holy Baal Shem Tev, whose 250th yard site we commemorate this year, once discussed what is Gehenim or hell, purgatory. We often understand the inferno of hell, Dante, Dante's inferno, this place where souls are satayed and barbecued to be punished for all of their horrendous sins and transgressions. But the Baal Shem Tev says that's not hell. Hell is not this grand celestial barbecue where souls are punished and satayed. Rather, hell is something very different it's a description of the moment when the soul returns to its maker and for the first time it has the opportunity to look at itself in the ultimate mirror not the mirror which reflects what you look like but the mirror which reflects what you could have looked like what you could have made of yourself there are two mirrors in life there are mirrors, when you look at them, you see what you look like. There are mirrors, when you look at them, you see what you're supposed to look like, what you can look like. 
when the soul returns to its maker, it gazes at such a mirror. It sees what it could have made itself. And when you compare what you could have been, when you compare the life you could have lived, if you would have only not been sleeping, when you compare that life with the life you actually lived, that for many people is hell. Now we can understand the conclusion of the Talmud that the angels got envious. Why were they envious? What they were envious is, and here I want you to open up source number four, and we have here the interpretation of the Ksav Seifer. Beautiful commentary on the Chumash of the Ksav Seifer. The rabbi of Preshburg today, it's Bratislava. He was the son of the famous Chassam Seifer, of Moshe Schreiber. And the Chassam Seifer gives us an interpretation for this conclusion of the Talmud, for this concluding part of the Talmud that you could read inside at, in source number four. And I'm going to read it with you together. Let's learn it together. A man is made of crass material stuff. When a man is born, a human being is born, he's only very, very, he's superior, very little to the animals. He's basically an animal, just a little more. Some more intelligence. But when he refines himself and he starts doing kindness constantly, he can ascend from plane to plane and reach higher than the angels. Vahatam, why does he reach higher than the angels? Angels don't have choice, they're programmed. The way they're created, that's the way they act. A person has choice and needs to elevate himself or herself through their voluntary commitment and must often challenge temptations and addictions and deep inclinations that are very powerful. When this person does refine herself or himself, he or she reaches a state that's higher than the angels and that's why the Talmud says that the angels don't start singing their song to God in the morning before Israel. First the humanity, first the Jewish people, and by extension humanity, and then the angels. The angels must wait till they start singing, because they are second. Here the Talmud says, The angels went up and they saw the image of Jacob above, engraved in the throne of glory. And then they come down and they see a physical human being sleeping on the ground in a body. Vihiskanu, they began to have envy. Eich guf achur kazeh. Yoviyatz melamayla kolkach yoysem amalach. How can an ugly, physical, crass, and crude body elevate itself to transcend the state of the angels? Vehivinu shaydeh bchirosi vekvishas yitzra oyla lamayla man. And they understood it's only because the human being has a choice. And the human being has to struggle against an evil inclination. That's why the human being can transcend even higher than the angels. This is what they understood. Or to put it in the, this, in the language we discussed before, suddenly they see that the image above is being reflected in the image below. But the image below usually doesn't reflect the image above. Because a person's life here is stressed. And a person is overtaken with so many demands. And so many issues and baggage and struggles and dilemmas. Like each of us knows in our own heart of hearts that which we say and even less that we don't say. And those issues we feel we can't share with anybody. Our image below often becomes tormented and fragmented. And the person absolutely cannot reflect their image above. But suddenly in Jacob's case, the physical body and the physical life became a mirror of the spiritual heavenly life of Jacob. And the angels became extremely envious. 
They looked up at this. They don't have to unite the two images. They don't have to be the missing link between heaven and earth. They're not the bridge in which the spiritual and the physical come together. Angels are spiritual. They're metaphysical creatures. It's the human being who is the bond, who is the candle, who's the bridge that integrates heaven and earth because the human being is a composite of both. We have the two images and Jacob unites them. And here is where they become envious. Bo lisikuna. They try to endanger him. Says the Ksav Seifa, what does it mean? They decided let them test him. Lisikuna means let them entice in him and kindle within him a fire of temptation towards something immoral and negative which will certainly have him fall down. And this is what happens throughout life. As you and I struggle to connect our two images, suddenly a curveball will come from somewhere, <laughs> from an angel who may be jealous of the human being's success and say, here is a temptation. And this will certainly ensure that the person below falls down and becomes detached. But the sages say, Somebody who comes to purify himself, he is helped from above. And the Talmud says, if God would not assist us in our war, in our moral war, we would not be able to triumph against our evil inclination. And that's where the Talmud continues, God stood right there in order to guard Jacob, to cool the temptations and to extinguish the fire of gluttony and addiction and craving. God is there. The moment the temptation comes and you feel like you must be fragmented, remember that God is right there to help you. If you'll only put your mind and your will to it, the divine light, the divine energy standing above the ladder will assist you to be able to continue to live a life of grandeur and allow your higher self to be reflected in your lower self, your image above to be mirrored in your image below. Every time your negative inclination wants to create in you a fire and a passion for sin, God is there to cool the fire. To be able to conquer this inclination under yourself. To be able to become the master of it. It's like the father fanning the child from a scorching heat. This is the metaphor. The angels wanted to impose a scorching heat. And the father stands and fans the child to be able to cool him off. To be able to regain his composure. To be able to regain his humanness and not fall prey to these temptations which sound so powerful. But really are the greatest betrayal against his or her true destiny, calling and essence. A colleague of mine, a rabbi in Israel, shared with me he was approached by parents. And they came to lament about how badly their child was behaving. He was nine years old, he was lying, he was stealing, he was cheating, he was deceiving. And the father sat and wept as he spoke about his nine-year-old child's behavior. At one point, the father tells the rabbi, he says, you know, I knew it's all coming. When this kid was three years old, I saw it all coming. When I observed his behavior as a three-year-old, I always said he's a little terrorist in the making. He's a ganav, he's a thief, he's a shakran, he's a liar. I could see the seeds of all the behavior that I see now. It was all right there then. To which the rabbi responded very wisely. He said, if that's the case, why are you weeping? Why are you crying? Your son lived up perfectly to the expectations you had of him. You see, what we see in our children is what they will see in themselves. What we see in our loved ones is what they will see in themselves. 
And what we see in ourselves is what we will make of ourselves. If I only see in my child his or her image below, our, his failings, his imperfections, his flaws, his blemishes, and every child has flaws, then that is the self-image that he or she will embrace. That is the diyukin that he or she will see in themselves. But if I muster the depth and the courage to see the yoikner shalmayla, to see the image below, to see them as soulful diamonds, as priceless gems, as reflections of God, as ambassadors of God in this world, as rays of heavenly light filled with tremendous goodness and potential, if I can appreciate them from their creator's perspective, then I will give them the tools to view themselves in the same way. This is true about our children and our students and our disciples. If you're a teacher, if you're an educator, and you go into a classroom, I don't care if it's children or adults, what do you see? Says the Alter Rebbe, look at those children as they are in Machshove, Hagdum, the Adam Kadmoin. When you walk into a community, you walk into a shul, you walk into your workplace, you walk into your classroom, you walk into your home, you look in the mirror. Look at yourself the way you are in Machshove Hagdum the Adam Kadman. In the initial thought of God, the way he perceived you, the way he experienced you, the way he understood you. You could see yourself the way God sees you. You can envision your psyche from a divine prism. Then ask yourself, what would you look like? How would you behave? What would you make of yourself? How would you treat other people? When I wake up in the morning every day, I must look not only at my image below, but also at my image above. And based on that, decide... Who am I going to be today, tonight?